Hi, so in this presentation we're going to be looking at adding and subtracting fractions. Um, the first of our big ideas that we need students to understand is the idea of unitization. So our students need to recognize that, for example, in the figure given here, that if we have four ninths, this is equivalent to having four lots of one ninth. So four multiplied by one ninth. That's our first big idea that we need students to really grasp and understand. Now carrying this idea forward, if we look at this example, we could say that we are adding four lots of one tenth and three lots of one tenth. So we're adding four lots and three lots of the same unitary value, which in this case is one tenth. So we have four lots of one tenth, three lots of one tenth, and we can see clearly that this would give us seven lots of one tenth in total, or seven tenths. Now in this example, we can't carry this through. So in this example, we have four lots of one seventh and three lots of one tenth. So we're adding four lots of one unitary value and three lots of a completely different unitary value. So this doesn't give us the same outcome as before. This is a key concept that students must understand and it will help them to realize that to solve a lot of problems when adding and subtracting fractions, they will need to make their denominators the same. Linked with this topic are uh, where students will simply attempt to add their numerators and add their denominators, regardless of what the values may be. So, for example, a common incorrect answer for this problem, so one half plus three eighths would be four tenths, because one plus three is equal to four and two plus eight is equal to ten. So, this is often attempted by students before we have discussions about unitization and the reasons why we can't just simply add the numerators and the denominators together. So, students need to understand that when we do this, we have to have our denominators the same and then we can add our numerators, but the denominator for our solution would still remain the same. Um, the other misconception would be in my opinion, what I've seen students do a lot of the time is to choose one of the denominators which they can use. So again, uh, they may attempt to add their numerators together and then either go with the biggest one, which is probably more common, or they might just simply choose to use the other one. So just a 50-50 guess whether they're going to use the first denominator or the second denominator. So they might get solutions of 4 over 8 or 4 over 2 in this example given. Now at this point, things that I would like to check would be that my students understand and can use certain representations. So for me, for this topic, um, using multi-link cubes might be useful depending on the ability of my group. Uh, bar models are also very useful for this topic. And number lines are also very effective, particularly when you're dealing with fractions which are greater than one. So you need to think about which ones of these might be appropriate for your group and make sure that they can understand and use these representations before you jump into teaching adding and subtracting fractions with them. make sure that students can answer questions like this so with or without representation so you might want to use a bar model to accompany you that's probably what that would probably be my go-to representation or again you could use a number line or some blocks so we can highlight that if we're calculating three eighths plus two eighths there's my three eighths and I'm adding another two eighths so I'm adding another two of the same unitary value so altogether I have five eighths and likewise for a subtraction we could Answer this question. So five eighths take away two eighths. So that would mean that we're beginning the problem with five eighths and we need to reduce this amount by two eighths. So from our five eighths, we need to take away two eighths, which would then leave us with three eighths or three lots of one eighth. The following questions are just examples of questions I might start to put into starters or possibly homeworks uh, just to assess that my students do indeed know that when we add and subtract fractions with the same denominator, the denominator remains the same and we can simply add or subtract our numerator when this is the case. Um, so things to explore might be the fact that we can have negative values as answers. 
Um, we can also look at interleaving other topics, so adding and subtracting decimals, or the fact that we can add and subtract uh, more than two fractions. Uh, other types of question I might put into this might be missing number problems, which would require that further level of thought and develop that fluency with the idea that, again, when our denominators are the same, uh, we can add and subtract the fractions comfortably. And further examples of interleaving might be to use some algebra. So being able to take the concept of the fact that the denominator will remain the same and we can add and subtract our numerators and then applying that to an algebraic context would also further solidify that knowledge that we need to move forward. That my students can find equivalent fractions. So I would maybe give my students something along these lines and with the following prompts. So how many counters are there in total? Well, there are four counters in total. We have one blue counter and therefore as a fraction, one quarter of these counters must be blue. I then give my students something similar to this. So here's another array and I would ask my students to tell me what's happened to the total number of counters what has happened to the number of blue counters and what fraction do we have? So the total number of counters has doubled and the number of blue counters has doubled also. And we can see from this diagram, we have two eighths of the counters which are blue. This is because we have eight counters in total and two of those are blue. However, if we look closer, some students should hopefully identify that this is still one quarter as a proportion. So we can say that two eighths is equivalent to one quarter. So it's exactly the same. So those, those counters are split into the same proportion as the original array. After this, I would ask my students to see if they can draw or see if they can create, if they have the equipment in front of them, see if they can create a new array of counters which has the same proportion. Once you've explored this, you might want to just show your students a diagram like this one. So we can see that every time if we add a row, as long as it has one blue counter and three yellow counters, we are always creating the same proportion of one quarter. And we can say from this figure that one quarter is equal to two eighths, which is also equal to three twelfths, which is also equal to four sixteenths. You might want to ask students to, without their equipment, so without counters or without drawing, to see if they can find another equivalent, to see if they can spot any patterns. So if they look at the numerators, for example, they can see that the numerators are increasing by one every time and the denominators are increasing by four. So they might be able to tell you that the next pattern in the sequence would be five out of 20. And the one after that might be six out of 24. Sure that my students are very fluent in finding equivalent fractions. So to do this, I give them something similar to the above. I have a bar model with one half shaded, and underneath this, I'm going to show that three sixths is equal to one half. So we've proven the statement at the bottom, which is that one half is equal to three sixths. To further firm this up, we can have a discussion about what happens when we do this. So if we think about this carefully, the total number of pieces the bar was split up into has been multiplied by three. So originally there were two pieces in the first bar model. However, this has been multiplied by three and we now have six pieces. And in the original bar model, there was one part shaded. However, this has now been multiplied by three as well. So we get this relationship between the numerators and the denominators. Another way to think about this is that we've taken one half and we've multiplied it by three over three. And that is equal to three sixths. This is a very good way to explain to your students why, although the numbers change, the fraction is equivalent. Because if we think about this carefully, three over three is just equivalent to the value of one. So we're multiplying a half by one effectively. However, it has changed the value of the numerator and denominator. So this is a key idea again, so students must know or understand that they are creating a fraction with the same proportion. It simply has different numbers in its numerator and denominator. 
fractions can find multiples, as this is another key skill needed when adding and subtracting fractions with different denominators. So in this example, I've asked students to find the first 10 multiples of 4, and then find the first 10 multiples of 6. Or you might want to give your students these lists first and explain what a multiple is. And after this, I give them the, the following prompts. So which multiples are common in both lists? Well, we can see that 12, 24 and 36 are in both lists. Um, what is the lowest common multiple? Well, we can see that 12 is the lowest common multiple. You might also want to ask students what the next common multiple would be. So we knew that 12, 24 and 36 were common multiples. Can they spot that these multiples are going up in 12s? So would they spot that the next common multiple would be 48? That might be something to explore at this point. Subtracting fractions. So, for example, if I'm in a position where I'm comfortable that my class have all the prerequisites necessary to access the learning, I'm, I would likely present them with a problem like this one. Doesn't have to be this one exactly, but something similar to this. And what I want students to get from this is to be able to identify fractions of an amount from a representation but without it being split into nice pieces, let's say. So, for example, if I have a shape that's split into 16 equal pieces and I have three of them shaded, it's quite easy to pick out the fact that that would be three sixteenths. With, with this example, it's not as easy because I have different sizes which would complicate things slightly. So my first question would maybe be, right, how much of this shape is shaded red? And then how much of this shape is shaded blue? And then to get us into how our lesson will start to evolve, uh, I then ask them how much is shaded altogether. Um, to do this, students will then need to think about unitization, whether or not they're consciously doing that or not. So they would need to think about splitting the shape into equal pieces so they can establish what they have. So yes, the red amount, they can say that they have one quarter, which would be correct. Mm -hmm. Um, however, to find the amount of the shape which is shaded blue, they would probably need to go down something like this, this kind of route, so to divide things into equal proportions. Um, also, if you look to the bottom right of the diagram, we can clarify that that is still split into four sixteenths in terms of the whole shape. Even though they're different shapes, we've still got equal pieces. So one of the triangles is equal to one of the smaller squares in this example. Now this is one of the bigger misconceptions when trying to tackle problems. So you need to watch out for this when it arises. Um, students need to understand that five eighths plus one quarter, if we are to calculate that, we must think of it as five eighths of one whole plus one quarter of the same whole. So in this example, this has been misinterpreted as five eighths of something plus one quarter of something else. And this can lead to lots of misconceptions and incorrect answers. So, for example, with this, some students might say the answer is six eighths because I have six things shaded and um, they've chosen a denominator of eight. Or they might say that we've got six quarters. So similarly, they've got six things shaded, but this time they've chosen a denominator of four. Or in this example, because I have 12 equal pieces and six of them are shaded, it might lead some students to think that the answer is six twelfths. And with this representation, that does seem viable. So we need to be careful when we're addressing this misconception. To our idea of unitization, which was used earlier in the presentation. So remember, students need to acknowledge that in order to add these together, they must have the same unitary value. So we can't add five eighths and one quarter together without thinking about it in a unitary sense first. So in this example, again, we can get the same incorrect answers with similar logic. So six eighths, there are six things shaded and they may choose a denominator of eight again. Um, six out of four or six quarters, again, there are six things shaded and they've chosen a denominator of four this time. Or six out of 12, we have six things shaded and there are 12 things all together. So that might lead students to the conclusion that that is the correct answer, which obviously it is not. So we need to watch out for this. Students need to answer the question five eighths plus one quarter. Well, I would show my students a bar model 
that looks like this there is my five eighths and I'm going to add one quarter to this amount so this amount needs to increase by one quarter I would have a discussion with my students as to what one quarter would look like on this bar model and hopefully they'll be able to tell me that it's the same as two so we know that one quarter is equal to two eighths and altogether we have seven lots of one eighth or seven eighths so we have five lots of one eighth plus two lots of one eighth which would give us seven lots of one eighth uh, if we look at a subtraction this is very similar we have seven eighths subtract one quarter so here is my bar model with seven eighths shaded so I've begun the problem with seven eighths and I need to reduce this amount by one quarter but again from the previous problem my students should know that uh, one quarter sorry is equal to two eighths so now we're taking seven eighths and reducing it by two eighths and this would leave us with five eighths or five lots of one eighth my students are using the correct mathematical language in the lesson they understand words that I'm using and they understand what things they need to check I might get students to complete some stem sentences on either on a whiteboard or they might do this as a class so like maybe say it together after the discussion so in this example if we're adding five eighths and one quarter we can say that eight is a multiple of four and therefore the con common denominator can be eight and this would mean that five eighths plus one quarter is equal to five eighths plus two eighths and again because we've got two fractions with the same unitary value we can add these together comfortably as we hopefully have done before we've started delving into this topic Once I feel my students are comfortable, I would normally give them a set of uh, varied questions or some intelligent practice just to get them to really think carefully about what's going on. I think a key aspect to this would be to maybe ask students to find the solution to the first question. So in the first example, we get a solution of three tenths and then ask students to predict what might happen for the second question before they calculate it. So don't jump straight in with the calculation. Think about what has changed and how this might impact their answer. So my denominator has changed from 10 to 15. How might students perceive this to change and see if it matches up with what they get as their correct answer. So for this one, we would get four out of 15. So if they haven't correctly predicted that, they can look at the relationship between question one and question two, and then think about what's happened for question three. So question three, if we look carefully, so question one, we got three tenths, question two, the numerator increased by one and the denominator increased by five what might students suggest would happen for question three we get the numerator increasing by one and the denominator increasing by five again and this is also equivalent to one quarter so we're exploring the fact that our answers can also be simplified and given in different forms uh, if we look over to question four we can see that the denominator for the first fraction has changed from a five to a ten so how might students interpret this to change and um, we get three out of 20 uh, for question five I've doubled the value of both the numerators and denominators for both fractions how might this change my answer well we can see that we get an answer of three out of 20 again this would be a nice discussion point because students may, may be able to identify that question four and question five we're adding the same two fractions so one tenth is equivalent to two twentieths and one twentieth is equivalent to two fortieths, which is why we ended up with the same answer of three twentieths. And again, likewise, for question six, we could ask students to once they've finished, why do they think the answer is three tenths? And if they compare this to question one, again, we can see that one fifth is equal to four twentieths and one tenth is equal to four fortieths. Hence why we have the same value of three tenths as our final answer. The next step is to ensure that our students can add and subtract non-related fractions. So this is where the larger of our two denominators is not a multiple of the smaller denominator. So to tackle this, I might pose my questions with a problem like this one. So we're not adding two fractions at the moment. We're just trying to find two equivalent fractions with the same denominator. And I think the best approach for this question will be to maybe get students to list equivalent fractions for both three quarters and one sixth and see if they can find a solution to their problem. Um, so these are some equivalent fractions to three quarters. 
and these are some equivalent fractions to one sixth. And we want students to identify that they can get two fractions with a denominator of 12 and they've solved the problem. You then might want to ask students what patterns they've noticed. So for the first set of fractions, we can see that the numerators have increased by three and the denominators have increased by four. And likewise for the bottom row, uh, the numerators have increased by one and the denominators have increased by six. Uh, you might want to ask students if there's more than one answer. So we've got the best one in terms of a strategy to add and subtract non-related fractions. Are there other equivalences? So they might spot that 24 is another denominator which could be used to solve the problem. You could then ask them if there are any more that they could find. So what would the denominator of the next one be? And then some students may be able to spot that this is just increments of 12 in the denominator. So the next common denominator will be 36. And this is because 36 is a common multiple of four and six. You could also link this to the task that we had before in the prerequisite section. So we asked students to find the first 10 multiples of four and the first 10 multiples of six. And we could see that the common multiples were 12, 24, 36, and so on, which was also a part of the solution to this problem with fractions. So we're doing the same thing, just dealing with fractions. So now we can apply this to adding and subtracting non-related fractions. So if I was going to solve this problem, I might show students something along these lines. So I have a bar model, which is worth three quarters. So I have three quarters of my bar model shaded. I can't add one six to that because they have two different unitary values. So I need to find a, a common unitary value which will help me with this problem. So at this point, students should be able to acknowledge that if we choose a denominator of 12, for example, obviously there are others, but if we choose 12, we can then add these fractions together successfully because we will be adding unitary values of one twelfth. So if I split this bar into 12, I can see at the moment my three quarters is equivalent to nine twelfths and one sixth of this bar model would be equivalent to two twelfths. So my problem has changed slightly. It's still equivalent, but I'm now answering the question of nine twelfths plus two twelfths, which would give me a final solution of 11 twelfths or 11 lots of one twelfth. And I look at a subtraction again, so very similar again. So I have three quarters. There's my bar model split into quarters. Again, I can't subtract one sixth from this. I need to make sure that I'm subtracting the same unitary values. So again, my common denominator of 12 comes into play. So at the moment I have nine twelfths, which is equivalent to my three quarters, and I need to take away one sixth. And we already know from the previous problem that this is equivalent to two twelfths. So we're taking nine twelfths, we're reducing this by two twelfths and that would leave us with seven twelfths as a final solution to our problem. Again, what I like to do with my students is just to ensure that they're using the correct vocabulary and they can identify key aspects to answer problems like this one. So for this, again, to complete our stem sentence, we would say that 12 is a multiple of both four and six. So we're looking at the two denominators and finding a common multiple. Therefore, the common denominator can be 12. It doesn't have to be, but it can be 12. We can have that discussion as well. And therefore, 3 quarters plus 1 sixth is equal to, and they should get two fractions over 12, which are 9 out of 12 and 2 out of 12. And once we have this, again, because we're dealing with the same unitary value, we can add them comfortably together. Another thing to explore will be if there is more than one solution to this problem. So we've discussed common multiples and we know that we like the lowest common multiple, but are there other ideas? So for example, we could say that 24 is a multiple of both four and six, and therefore the common denominator can be 24. And we could approach the question using 18 over 24 and four over 24. Now, this is, this is a discussion which I love to have with my students when we approach this kind of level of maths in terms of adding and subtracting fractions. So I often find that I get to a bit of a crossroads with my students. So some students are comfortable finding lowest common multiples. Um, some students may not find the lowest common multiple, but they do find a common multiple. Or in lots of cases, I find students can kind of grasp onto the idea that if they multiply their two denominators, 
um, they will always find a common denominator. So it kind of takes a, a little bit of the work out that way. So they think, right, OK, if I can multiply four and six together, it gives me 24. 24 has to be a multiple of four and six because it is the product of four and six. So it does make logical sense and it is fa it's a perfectly fine strategy to use. Um, what I find often useful is to discuss with students which one of those might be more efficient. So, for example, with this, um, in terms of which one is more efficient, on the left hand side, if we chose the lowest common denominator, uh, we get a solution of 11 twelfths quite easily. Whereas on the right hand side, um, we would have to get the conclusion that we're going to get 22 over 24. Um, another nice discussion you can have at this point is that that is also correct. So that is equal to 11 twelfths. But for example, in a lot of GCC questions, students are often asked to give their answer in, a, in its simplest form. So if students don't acknowledge or realize that they can simplify 22 over 24, for example, they would potentially drop max. Um, and this would obviously be equal to 11 twelfths if they did simplify this. But I think when you when you look at this working out, you can clearly see that the working on the left hand side is more efficient than the working on the right hand side. But obviously the working on the left hand side relies heavily on students being able to comfortably um, find lowest common multiples. But again, this is often a nice discussion to have with pupils and it gets them to think about alternate ways of solving certain problems. Well, where does this lead us? Well, once our students have mastered adding and subtracting fractions, this will then build a firm foundation for students to access learning further down the line. So, for example, our students should be able to add and subtract algebraic fractions or at the very least access this. They should be able to divide fractions by following a similar strategy. So finding a common denominator and then dividing their numerators. Uh, they should be able to apply this understanding to adding and subtracting mixed numbers. And they could also apply some of this strategy to comparing fractions. So finding a common denominator and using this to compare the relative size of two or more fractions. We could solve equations which involve addition or subtraction of fractions. And likewise, with rearranging, anything involving adding and subtracting fractions could be tackled by applying our knowledge. Um, we can apply this to probability problems. So using conditional prob probability where we will often be asked to add or subtract fractions with different denominators. So this is a key skill involved in this and also rationalizing denominators. So when we start looking at things like adding fractions with denominators involving thirds, so rationalizing our denominator and then simplifying would also incorporate some of the skills we've spoken about.